Today we're going to take a look at building a camera controller that can avoid obstacles in the game. We want to build a system that will maintain an ideal distance away from the player and adjust itself as necessary. Today's code will work great with the player controller that we wrote last week, or you can adapt this to your own controller. On top of that, we're also going to build a ceiling detection system that will reverse the player's momentum. Let's get started. Let's take a quick look at this setup in the hierarchy. Underneath the hero, we've got a model route and a camera route. So we've separated the concerns between the visuals and what the camera is actually going to do. The camera route I've actually set to have a vertical Y of two. So it's just a little bit above the player. If we go down one more level, I've got another game object that I've called camera controls. This is where we're going to put the scripts that we write for the camera today. Underneath that, I have another game object, camera target. Now this marks the ideal distance I would like the camera to sit behind the player. So I've set my Z to minus six for that. And of course, underneath that, I've just got a plain, simple camera. Let's dive right into the camera controller code and set up some fields. I want this controller to be able to rotate around the player in the X and the Y. So let's keep two fields for those. I also want to be able to set how far we can actually rotate up and down. So let's have an upper and a lower vertical limit that we can adjust in the inspector. Then let's have some public fields for our camera speed, how fast we want to rotate. Let's optionally apply some camera smoothing and let's also have a float value so that we can set how much smoothing we want to apply. And finally, let's cache some references. This transform, the camera that's orbiting the player, and our input reader scriptable object that has the look direction property on it. And just for convenience, let's add some public methods to get the up direction and get the facing direction of this particular game object. Now that we're done with that, let's just collapse up this fields region and carry on. Let's get references to everything that we need in the awake method. Our transform, our camera, which was a child of that whole chain of everything underneath the camera root. We can immediately set the X angle and the Y angle using the transforms local rotation dot Euler angles dot X and dot Y values. The actual functionality of this class isn't really complex. In the update method, we can just rotate the camera based on the values that the input reader is telling us from the look direction property. Inverting the Y direction is just my personal preference. So let's set up a new method, rotate camera. It'll take in the two floats. The first thing to check is, do we want to smooth the camera rotation or not? If we do, let's use a lerp between zero and its current value, and then we'll pass in time dot delta time multiplied by our camera smoothing factor. Let's do exactly the same thing for the vertical input. Next, let's adjust the current X angle by the vertical input scaled by speed and time. Again, we'll do the exact same thing for the Y angle. Then let's clamp the X angle to ensure that it stays within the vertical rotation limits. Finally, let's apply the updated rotation angles to this game object. And that's it really. It's a very simple orbital camera controller. Before we test this out though, let's also build the functionality that'll allow the camera to dodge obstacles in the game. For this, I've started a new class, Camera Distance Raycaster. This class is going to be responsible for dynamically adjusting the distance between the camera and the camera target game object in the scene based on obstacle detection. Let's initialize a layer mask to include all layers. You can do that with not zero. Zero is a 32-bit integer where all the bits are zero. If we use the not operator on it, it will turn them all to ones. You could also do this with negative one or use the constant physics.all layers. Then let's set a minimum distance the camera should maintain from obstacles. We can add a factor for controlling how smoothly the camera distance adjusts when an obstacle is detected. Let's cache a reference to this object's transform, and let's store the current distance between the camera and its target. Let's create an awake method. Let's cache that transform reference. Then let's exclude the ignore raycast layer from the layer mask so it doesn't interfere with any raycasting or sphere casting that we're going to do. Then let's calculate the initial distance between the camera target and its current position. We can handle all of the obstacle avoidance in late update. First, let's calculate the direction vector from the camera's position to the target's position. Then we're going to need to determine the appropriate amount of distance from the camera to the target considering obstacles. So let's do that in another method. Let's calculate the full distance from the camera's position to the target's position, plus a small buffer to make sure that the camera doesn't get too close to any obstacles. Then we're going to perform a raycast from the camera's position in the direction of the target. And just like last week, we're going to ignore any triggers. If we hit anything, let's calculate the distance to the obstacle minus the minimum distance buffer. We don't want any negative values, so we'll wrap it up in a mathf.max statement. If we didn't hit anything, let's return the full distance to the target. Now we can come back up to the late update method. 
Let's smoothly interpolate the current distance to the new calculated distance over time. Then we'll update the camera's position based on the new current distance and the direction to the target. And maybe before we test, we'll add one more thing. Let's make the player turn towards the direction that the camera is facing. Got another class set up here for that. We'll call it Turn Towards Controller. Last week, we set up our player controller such that if we give it a reference to an external transform, like our camera, we'll be able to move in the direction that that transform is pointing in. So our player controller already has that logic. What we need to do now is actually do the rotation of the model. So we're going to put this component on the model root. Let's expose a few more fields. We need a speed at which this object rotates towards the movement direction. Let's cache a reference to the transform. Let's store the current y-axis rotation of the object. And let's also define an angle at which the rotation speed begins to fall off. That'll smooth the turn as the angle difference increases. In our start method, let's cache a reference to the transform, and then let's initialize the current y rotation to the local y rotation of the object. We'll handle all the rotations to the model root in late update. Let's get the player's movement velocity projected onto the plane defined by the parent's up direction. If the magnitude of the velocity is very small, let's just bail out. Otherwise, let's calculate the angle difference between the current forward direction and the velocity direction. Now we can determine the step size for rotation based on that angle difference, our turn speed, and that fall off angle. We can use mathf.sign to determine the direction to rotate in, and then we can use an inverse lerp to gradually reduce the rotation speed as the angle difference approaches the fall off angle. Then we can multiply all of that by time dot delta time and our turn speed. That'll give us a nice smooth turn step. Now we don't want to overshoot our target during the rotation. So let's say if the step is larger than the angle difference, then we'll just rotate by the angle difference. Otherwise, we'll apply the step. Now we know what we want our current y rotation to be. Let's apply it to the transform. OK, well, that's all we have to do for this. I think it's about time we had a little test. So we've got a little bit of setup to do in Unity. I've already set my Y position on my camera root to 2. On the camera target, I've got the Z set to behind the player by 6. That's about right for what I want for this game. Now we need to add some components. So I'm going to come back to the camera controls, and I'm going to drag on our camera controller, and I'm going to drag on that camera distance raycaster. Now we've got to set some references here. I'm going to drag the camera target into its slot. I'm going to drag the camera into its slot. And I'm going to grab our input reader scriptable object and put it into the camera controller. So that's good enough. If I come up to the model root, this is where I want to put that turning component. So I'm going to grab the turn towards controller, drag that in. It needs a reference to our hero. I think I'm going to adjust this turn speed a little bit. 50 is going to be slow for a demo. Let's turn it right up to 500. OK, let's hit play. Now, I want to make sure the camera is rotating smoothly, but I also want to make sure that if I turn the camera to point one direction, the player will rotate and walk in that direction. So this is looking pretty good. The turning is fast and it's, you know, it looks pretty smooth. OK, so the turning's looking good. Even while jumping, that looks pretty good. Let's come over to an obstacle and make sure that that's working. So let's come over to the pyramid here. If I angle the camera a little bit so that it would normally go inside of the pyramid, yeah, you can see the raycast does fire off. As soon as it hits, the camera will adjust its position. Now you can see there's some clipping issues here. There's a couple things we could do about that. We could increase that minimum distance buffer, but that might be hard to gauge on different kinds of screens. But you, you definitely could do that. You could make it longer so that you wouldn't get that sort of weird clipping. Another thing that we could do is change it from a raycast to a sphere cast. So let's come in here to our get camera distance method. I'm just going to comment out our raycast. And instead, what we can do is set ourselves up for a sphere cast and try that out. So first of all, let's set a radius for our sphere. And then we're going to do almost the same thing. We're going to do that sphere cast. In fact, the only real difference here is the arguments that are being passed in. We just need to add that sphere radius. So these are almost identical. Let's go try it out. So let's hit play and come back over to the pyramid here. And now we'll be able to see that sphere cast giving us a little bit of a smoother adjustment here. And it's going to work not only uh, in the left and right, but when we're going up and down as well. So if I were to, let's see, come down to the floor here, see, that works pretty well too. Not too bad, it's nice and smooth. Even when going from the floor up to the edge, it looks nice. Now keep in mind, you can use this technique of using a sphere cast instead of a ray cast with our ground detection that we did last week too. So if you're ever building a controller and you're finding it's just too hard, it's never finding the ground properly, a sphere cast will give you a little bit more flexibility. 
You'll just have to take that radius into consideration with your calculations. Now, last week we did talk about making a ceiling detector, and we might as well do that right now. Let's start by having a field that'll define the maximum angle between the upper direction and the contact normal that is considered a ceiling. So we can say if the difference is less than or equal to 10, we've definitely hit the ceiling. Let's add some additional fields to help with some debugging, just in case we want to draw some angles while we're playing. So we could have a Boolean, say if we're in debug mode or not, how long we actually want to draw lines on the screen for. And let's have a Boolean to indicate whether we actually hit the ceiling or not. Now we can check for this during an on collision enter. We can also check it on collision stay. Both of those will be handled the same way. So we'll have to make a shared method check for contact. Let's start with the guard clause. If there are no contact points, let's just bail out early. Otherwise, let's calculate the angle between the object's upward direction and the contact normal. If the angle is less than the ceiling angle limit, we'll set the ceiling was hit flag. If we have debug mode enabled, let's draw a red ray just to visualize the collision. Finally, let's make a few public methods for the ceiling detector. One will be a hit ceiling method returns true or false. The other one will be a reset. So after we're done handling the ceiling collision, we can just reset the flag again. Now, last week, we set up a state machine to handle all the different states and transitions in our player controller, but we don't have any transitions that involve hitting the ceiling. Why don't we add another one here that says, if we're in the jumping state, we're going to move to the falling state as long as we have a ceiling detector and it actually returns true from the hit ceiling method. Now, the same thing applies if we're in the rising state and those conditions are true, we should then move to a falling state. Now, we should still reset those flags in the ceiling detector. We can actually do that in the fixed update method right after we reset our jump keys. We're resetting these other flags here. We can do this one at the same time. Okay, well, how about we jump back into Unity and make sure that it works? Well, let's grab that ceiling detector and drag it right onto the hero so that we'll have a reference to it. And I'm going to need some kind of ceiling. I'll grab this gear and just drag it up to here. That should be reasonable, but you know, just for the sake of testing, let's change the actual jump duration of our hero so that he can jump quite a lot higher than normal. Now, if I hit play here, let's just check it out. Like how high can I actually go? Yeah, definitely higher than the gear. So come underneath and I hit it and it takes me back to the falling state. This is not very snappy though. I think what I'd really like is for it just to immediately reverse my momentum. Let's jump back into code and make one small adjustment. We have several methods here that are being called by our different states. Why don't we add another method that we can call when we enter the falling state? I'm just going to call this, let's say, on fall start. Let's figure out exactly what our current upwards momentum is using the vector math dot extract dot vector method that we talked about last week. Next, we can remove all vertical momentum using the remove dot vector method from the same class. Finally, we'll just subtract the magnitude of the vertical component in the opposite direction that will effectively reverse the vertical momentum. So we need to call this on fall start method from somewhere. And the perfect place to do that is in the falling state on enter method. So we haven't defined one of those yet. Let's make a new one here. All we have to do is call the controller on fall start. So let's hit play and see what happens when we do some jumping. If we come under the gear here, yeah, you'll see immediately, we just get an immediate reversal of our momentum. That looks like a good point for a dust cloud or some kind of VFX. So anyway, regular jumping seems fine, but you got to remember this is going to fire any time we enter the falling state, including walking off these ledges here. So we just got to make sure that still looks correct. And of course it does because our vertical momentum when we're walking off an edge is actually zero. There's nothing to reverse. Now, of course, that might be too snappy for some games, or you might think that it's not snappy enough. Of course, you can just change that logic. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Next week is going to be something totally different. And I was experimenting with a new brightness feature today. So if you found the code in today's video easier to read, let me know in the comments. Or conversely, if you found it harder to read, maybe it's too bright, let me know that as well, and I'll make some adjustments. Links to Discord and the code from this video in the description. Hit like, subscribe, and you can watch more videos from the channel by clicking on one of these boxes on your screen. Maybe I'll see you there.